Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar on how to unleash unlimited performance on Kubernetes with scale out storage. Kubernetes is a great platform to run scale out workloads from serving user generated content via engine to machine learning or data analytics. Kobyte allows to share a persistent volume across thousands of nodes so you can easily scale your application from a few replicas to hundreds. In this webinar, we will demonstrate how to connect your Kubernetes cluster to Kobyte and use read write many volumes. The demo will also explain how you can scale non cloud native applications in Kubernetes using WordPress as an example, and how to take advantage of the RWX persistent volumes served by the Kobyte cluster. I'd like to begin by introducing our speakers. First, Bjorn Kolbeck is one of the founders of Kobyte. Bjorn spent his time at Google working as a tech lead for the Hotel Finder project. He was a lead developer for the open source file system ExtremeFS. His PhD thesis dealt with fault tolerant replication. Jan Peschke. Jan is a solutions engineer at Kobyte. He is interested in what humans do with technology more than the technology itself. Jan started his career in storage mainly from a user perspective. Starting from a small web hosting company, he went on to work at a supercomputer facility, building highly scalable web hosting scenarios, and later on being accountable for a cloud engineering team responsible to provide public cloud service infrastructure. I'd now like to pass it over to Bjorn. Thank you, SK. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so I'll start with a brief intro of what Kobet is and how we see the world of storage. Um, then I'll also dive into security because that is a bit of the stepchild of storage, but in terms of Kubernetes infrastructure, securing a storage is an important part. So this is why we'll briefly cover this today. And then I'll talk about um, how your Kubernetes cluster and your Kobite cluster are connected. And then I'll shut up and hand it over to Jan for the important part, which is the actual demo. He'll show you how you connect those two clusters and how you can run um, an application to take advantage of the read write many volumes on Kobite. Um, Kobite itself is a POSIX file system, which means you can run any application you can run on Linux, um, you can run it on Kobite. It's a distributed system, meaning that we um, distribute your data across many machines and make them act as one. Um, the advantage of that is that you can basically aggregate the performance of all of those machines into one big storage system. And the reason that we did that with Cobite is our um, hyperscale experience. Uh, some of us, including me, have worked at Google. And Google basically pioneered this idea of scalar computing. They called it um, warehouse scale computing. Not everyone has a Google scale, but we can all take advantage of this idea of aggregating many computers into one system, because then you basically can scale without limits. And that's also the reason why we love Kubernetes, because Kubernetes coming out of Google follows the same idea that you can build applications um, that scale out with demand. And Kubernetes is the infrastructure to run those applications. Um, we have been a part of Kubernetes very early on. Um, we actually looked at it. Today is uh, day 1616 of our first Kubernetes support. So we have been um, committed to Kubernetes for almost five years now. One of the first storage vendors to have an entry driver. Things look a bit different nowadays, but our Kubernetes support is still there um, and growing. So because of our background, we do things a bit differently than uh, many other storage uh, companies and approaches. Um, I would say it's heavily informed by the way Google does things. The first one is uh, what we call unlimited performance. The idea that you can always scale out with more hardware if you have a system that is built in a, um, based on a scalable architecture. The second approach is uh, what we call deploy anywhere. Um, we're a software product, 100% software. We don't rely on specific hardware, which means you can run us on almost any x86 server. Um, I'll talk about that in a moment, but basically Kubernetes is part of this. And then the last uh, part, which is equally important, the unconditional simplicity. If you want things to scale, you have to make sure that they're really easy to run um, and install because otherwise um, this will prevent you from scaling at all. 
But let's start with uh, the unlimited performance, which sounds a bit bold, but in the end, um, you can put it that way. Our architecture is built in a very scalable way. We avoided bottlenecks. We made sure that the fault tolerance um, across nodes doesn't rely on things like centralized block services and so on. And the end result is an architecture where the performance is limited by the hardware. And in the end, the budget that you have to put more hardware behind it. Um, in most cases, Cobalt will scale far beyond what you can afford in terms of hardware. The nice effect is that when you double the number of servers, you'll get twice the performance, whether that's IOPS or throughput or capacity. It means that when your application suddenly becomes super popular and you need to run 100 times the instances, you can also add more storage resources to make sure that you have the performance to deliver um, from those 100 instances. Then the deploy anywhere means really almost any x86 server that has a decent modern CPU and sufficient RAM. Um, we can't make your old hardware um, super fast, but if you have decent hardware, if you have very fast hardware, we can squeeze the maximum performance out of it. Um, all we need is servers with an Intel or AMD CPU, uh, direct attached drives that can be NVMe or hard disk or a mix of both. Um, and then you can install Cobalt on them. That also includes the public cloud, so you can run on any of the public clouds, whether it's their virtual machines or their bare metal instances or a mix of both. And then um, something we'll talk about today is that you can also run us on Kubernetes. So Cobalt can provide storage to Kubernetes, but can be also another application on your Kubernetes cluster, if you like. So you can deploy Cobalt on um, plain Linux or on containers. And regarding the simplicity, it starts already with the install. So to do um, the demo that Jan does today, um, you need a Cobalt cluster and you can install it within a few minutes with the command line that you see here. All you need is a few Linux machines um, that you can log into. Or if you like to run Cobalt on Kubernetes itself, we have an Helm, a Helm chart that you can use to install a cluster. Uh, in both cases, it's very straightforward, takes a few minutes because we don't need kernel modules. Uh, our servers don't need local configuration, uh, including things like FSTAB. Um, so there is nothing configured locally. The mounts happen automatically. And uh, the system finds everything else through our registry service. And what you'll find is that Cobite is just another Linux application. Uh, you don't need special knowledge on storage hardware. You don't need to know how to compile kernel modules and load them. It's really out of the box, install RPM or deploy a container and that's it. Uh, and everything we do today in the demo, you can do with the free edition. Um, you can get that on our website. Uh, it includes 150 terabytes of free storage forever. Um, so we encourage you to use that to actually um, run your own Kubernetes infrastructure or try out the demo that Jan does today. So coming back to the storage security that I mentioned earlier, uh, when you run an infrastructure like Kubernetes, uh, you often want to run applications that are user facing or internet facing, or you run applications from multiple users because you essentially provide an infrastructure for different teams in, inside your company. In all of those cases, it's, it's important that storage also contributes to the overall security of your Kubernetes cluster. You don't want the storage to be the weakest link, especially when we talk about important data, whether it's company data or customer data. When you think about applications like analytics or machine learning, where the data is very valuable, you have to protect the data also inside Kubernetes. And we provide um, three different uh, tools or features that help you to achieve a higher level of data protection and storage than with traditional uh, appliances. The first one is end-to-end -end data encryption. So in that mode, the data is encrypted by the callback client, which exists or runs on the same machine as your application. And the client will encrypt the data before it ever leaves the machine. And then the callback storage system handles only encrypted data Basically, anything outside of the node can be untrusted. The network, um, 
the storage servers, the storage admins, um, the team that runs the hardware. So this level of protection is important um, if you mix, for example, uh, applications from different users on the same storage hardware. Um, not surprisingly, this also includes address encryption. So you, if, if that's a mandatory requirement, uh, the end-to-end -end data encryption provides uh, much more than just address encryption. In Corbett, you can enable that based on the policy engine. So for some customers, for some volumes, or you can create um, a separate storage class just for encrypted volumes. You can check out our tutorial uh, on our website. If you go to corbett.com slash K8S, um, you can see the tutorial how to connect your storage classes to the Corbett policy engine to provide, for example, encrypted storage next to NVMe storage, database storage, and so on. Then the second part is um, encrypting all communication in flight. Uh, so this encryption of communication with TLS and the end-to-end -end data encryption are orthogonal uh, because they protect your data in different ways. With TLS, uh, everyone knows it, it's an encrypted tunnel between core byte clients and core byte servers. Um, but the data is basically decrypted um, on the server side. So it doesn't protect you from, exam for example, from untrusted storage admins, and it doesn't provide address encryption. So you can easily achieve that with the end-to-end -end encryption and then use TLS to make sure that all the communication across clusters, across the internet, um, is fully encrypted. And you also have X509 certificates to ensure that you're really talking to the right storage cluster. Um, that's great for use cases where you have edge applications or where your clusters are um, distributed across the internet and you don't want to use VPN gateways because they introduce another performance bottleneck. In that case, the TLS tunnels um, help you to achieve uh, this additional layer of security. And then the last one is um, access control, which is kind of um, a topic that's often ignored in Kubernetes because uh, most people think, okay, I don't care about access control because I have my persistent volumes which is often true, but when we talk about data sharing, like in uh, analytics or machine learning applications, it's important that the users actually can only access the data they are authorized to do or to access. In that case, um, the fact that you can basically send IO from a container with any user ID is a problem. You can be root, and if that, um, is translated to root on the file system or to some other random user ID, you basically can circumvent any access control. Um, to avoid this problem, we implemented access keys in Kubernetes. You know them from S3. We extended that to the file system. Users can use the same credentials um, that they use for S3 on Kubernetes um, for their file system, for their persistent volume claims. They basically put the credentials um, in their deployment descriptors and their YAML files. And then the Cobite client uses them to authorize the user against the storage system. And then also gets the user identity, the user ID that's connected to this uh, access key and maps all IO onto that user ID. So no matter what the user or application sends from within the container, all IO is mapped onto that user ID. And that restores the, the ability of the file system to provide access control. And then you can do regular NFS v4 ACLs to control which user has access to which subset of your data sets. And that's important if you have those shared volumes um, with sensitive data on them. Um, that was enough about security. Um, before we dive into the demo, I'd like to give you an overview of how Quobyte works um, together with the Kubernetes cluster. So here on the right-hand side, we have the Quobyte uh, cluster running. And as I mentioned, this can be on bare metal or it can be on nodes that are managed by Kubernetes. Both options are possible. In both cases, you have the Quobyte services like data services and metadata services that provide the file system functionality. And you have the Cobalt API, which is like the entry point for other components to talk to our system to, for example, create volumes, create quotas, um, create access keys, those kind of things. Then on the left-hand side, you have your Kubernetes cluster. And in that cluster, you have the Cobalt CSI plugin running. 
this plugin listens to uh, the Kubernetes API and checks for persistent volume claims that have the Cobalt provisioner uh, configured. If it sees one of them, it will actually uh, check whether the volume exists. If the volume doesn't exist, it creates a, a Cobalt volume. And if you want to configure it, it will also create a quota. And then the CSI plugin tells the kubelets which volume on Cobite to map into your application. So assuming I have a persistent volume claim, read, write many that I want um, in all of my application containers to be mounted as slash data. Um, the CSI plugin will create this new volume. Here it's called PVC1. I think in Jan's demo, you'll see that they have a bit of a longer name, but for simplicity, we call it PVC1. Um, as soon as it's created, it automatically appears on all the Cobalt clients. And then uh, Kubernetes maps this folder into the application and you have full read write access shared across as many nodes as you like. And when you scale this up, um, the volume is also instantly accessible on all the other nodes where your application is running. Thanks Pion. No, from my point of view, that's fine. Hi to everybody. So I can take over the screen sharing and we can move to the more hands-on part. Um, cool. So I share my screen. Um, before we before we start really doing something, I also prepared some slides. It's only four slides, and it's um, but just to give a rough orientation what we want to achieve. Um, Björn already mentioned scaling as a buzzword, maybe. Um, or scaling as a word. So I think it makes sense just to repeat what we understand, in, um, yeah, what, what scaling means to us. Scaling is a very old approach just to satisfy user requests that are coming in to, serve, to yeah, do something, to interact somehow with your application. And scaling from that understanding means nothing else but having more than one computer. So in this example, we have an application running on three or four or many application servers. Each of them have their disks um, attached and that is the rough concept of scaling. That's all for now. If we switch now to a Kubernetes view, the architecture stays exactly the same, only the naming uh, changes. And of course, we have some stickers, some labels, uh, it's, it has other names and a nice Kubernetes logo on. But we have on top the load balancing service, which is a headless, sometimes called headless service in the Kubernetes world. We have the applications running inside pods. So basically you have a containerized application running inside a pod. And then you have some, some kind of storage usually attached directly to the pod. So you have a one-to-one -one relation um, between pod and storage device or persistent volume in Kubernetes language. Um, what does it mean for your application? This is a concept that works pretty well for stateless applications. So what happens if your yeah, application is successful, you have more users than you, you're used to, you just scale out by adding more pods. So that is a one line in Kubernetes, you're, you're increasing the replicas and then you have could scale up to, I don't know, 100 pods, whatever, whatever you need. But it's really getting complicated if you have to deal with dynamic content. So assuming you're creating something like a photo upload service and users can interact. So one user um, uploads a photo, the load is balanced, he lands on, he, he then ends up on pod number three the photo or the image is stored on one persistent volume number three and then you want to show this photo to a colleague or friend of him and the friend or the other visitor ends up in persistent volume two so this is um, something that works only very limited it works well at first for stateless applications but as soon as if you have an application with dynamic content where something has changed and that change comes from not controlled by you. So you are not the one um, ingesting 
content to your system, but other users, then you have a problem. And that problem is not, uh, not a new problem. It is an old problem and it also exists long before Kubernetes. Um, and that is where the concept of shared storage comes from. So basically, you um, have the same story, story, a user will upload a photo or some, some data, and it now ends up in the same shared storage where every application, server, instance, VM, whatever is connected to, and then every instance can deliver this content. So again, we can switch back to Kubernetes. We are talking about the same content concept here, and we have the headless service, we have the pods, and then we have one storage device where many pods are connected to. So, and if you have that in a writable manner, so you can really, or your users can dynamically interact with your application, they can upload something, they can write to the storage, then you have the access mode read write many. There are many other scenarios how you can scale something, but very briefly, this is the concept of scaling and this is what we want to achieve in the practical example later on. So basically we are not connecting a cobalt cluster for fun to a Kubernetes cluster, but we want to achieve exactly this one thing. We want to be able to scale out the pods. And if you use cobalt for that, you're also able to scale out the storage layer. So basically what you should keep in mind um, is that you have um, not this one um, shared storage thing. So basically like an NFS appliance with one IP exported and everyone accesses this one IP or one write head and then data log, um, ends up on one device. If you do this with, with Crobyte, um, you have a distributed device or file system. And that means that you have many, many data services you could talk to. So basically every pod could talk to another data service and that is where um, it is more reliable and it also gives you more parallel performance for that. Very well. Thank you, Jan, and thank you, Bjorn, for wonderful presentations. Uh, we have great questions in the chat window. Let's try to get most of them with the time we have at hand. Uh, first one asks, what happens if multiple clients access the same data? Should I be worried about locking? Yeah, that's a good question. That depends on your application. Um, if your application is already cloud native, uh, then you most likely don't have to worry about it. If you have an application like here in this example, MySQL, um, you should use a feature called implicit locking in Cobite where we lock the files for you because your application didn't know about that. It's a typical fencing out zombie problem. Um, and if your application uses um, file system locks already, that works in a scalable way with Quobyte. So the answer is, um, depending on your application, you can enable implicit locking or your application locks, or your application doesn't need locking at all. For example, machine learning, where it's read-only um, data access, then you don't need locking at all. Great, thank you, Bjorn. Uh, our next question asks, uh, or says, you said client-side in encryption prevents storage admins to access sensitive data. Where are the encryption keys generated and stored? Um, the encryption keys are generated and stored on the registry. Um, they are encrypted with a, one or more system path or passwords that, need, that are required to decrypt them. Um, and the transfer itself for the keys happens over TLS encrypted channels. Great, thank you. Now, next question. Uh, I don't get the difference between the NFS approach and your setup. Uh, is there actually a difference between the two? Um, not for the application, um, because NFS and Kubai both behave the same towards the application. Um, the main difference is in terms of the scalability. So NFS is a protocol designed 30 years ago, roughly, uh, for communication with a single server. Um, that's great if you have one instance running, um, but you'll run into trouble if you scale it up to 100 instances. Um, that's where the Quobyte scale architecture makes a difference. Thank you. 
you mentioned that I can run Cobite on Kubernetes. Does that mean that I can run hyperconverged? What would be the benefit? Um, yes, you can run hyperconverged, but there are a few things you need to keep in mind. Um, whenever you run a hyperconverged, you have to isolate performance. And that's particularly tricky when it comes to storage, because if you have applications that are, are consume all the resources and start the storage system and then wait for the storage to happen um, or IO operations to happen, you have a problem. So if you really want to run hyperconverged, you need to keep in mind that um, you can't over provision memory or you have to set your OM killer properly to make sure that the core by client is never terminated. Um, then you need to isolate um, memory bandwidth, which often means that you need to um, allocate a whole socket, a whole uh, CPU to Quobyte to have the memory bandwidth allocation between the user applications and the storage system because you don't really know um, what your users are running. And then networking is another topic. Um, depending on your infrastructure, it might make sense to have a storage backbone and um, to isolate network traffic. Um, that's the things to keep in mind when you want to run hyperconverged. But uh, even if you don't run hyperconverged and you have dedicated storage nodes, um, you can still manage it, um, manage the whole Quobite cluster with Kubernetes, um, and then you have the simplicity of the management. Thank you. I know we're at the top of the hour, but we'll try to squeeze in just two questions. Uh, why should I care about access control on persistent volumes? Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you have data sets that you share, for example, machine learning or, or uh, data analytics, they often work on data sets that are either customer generated data or uh, valuable data, could be from medical devices, medical imaging, whatever. So you can think of many scenarios where you want to make sure that um, certain groups of users, certain departments can only access parts of the shared storage which is uh, where you use access control as, as a mechanism. Um, and if you want to use that in a container context, um, you need to make sure that your access control isn't circumvented by the user ID uh, problem with containers. Great. Um, and the audience member who had asked a previous question has come back with the clarification. Uh, let's take that. Um, if keys are stored on the registry and admins have access to the registry, what prevents an untrusted admin to gain access to the key and decrypt the data. Um, Would you like to take it now? That's correct. If the admins have access to the machine and can extract the keys from RAM, then that is a scenario, yeah. I believe we also have user supplied keys on the roadmap, um, but that is something that I'll defer to our CTO uh, for, a later, for a later point. Awesome. Thank you. Um, last one. What is the benefit of using Kobite on a public cloud Kubernetes offering like GKE? Hmm. I guess that means compared to um, the persistent volumes, I don't know, it's called persistent disks, sorry, the block storage that you typically find on the public cloud. Um, the benefit of using um, a scale out file system like Cobalt, but also others, is that you can run your applications and scale them out. Those that expect an app, um, a file system, WordPress is one example, but um, you can also have other applications like um, chip design, a lot of the um, scientific applications, they expect a file system. If you, if you have that kind of um, application, then you need a, a scale up file system, which is not a block store. Obviously, so that that's the benefit of running Cobalt then, that you can basically lift those applications from on-prem onto the cloud with containers onto the container engine um, without any changes to the application. Awesome. With that, we are um, at the end of what our presentation was supposed to be. Uh, there's a small question that asks, how does Cobalt compare to its competitors? If you want to quickly uh, answer that in one sentence, Bjorn. Yeah, um, I, I, the storage field is, is big. At first, there's um, different classes of how to do storage for Kubernetes. A lot of our Kubernetes competitors that focus on Kubernetes offer a, a block storage approach where they have a local block store that 
the application sees as a persistent volume. In that case, it's not shared, um, which reduces the utility in my mind uh, for, for those kind of storage systems. And then if you want to share it, use an NFS export, um, which comes with uh, well-known problems of lack of scalability. Um, then I think, you know, if you look more into the file system space, um, the question is which um, other solution runs on, Kubernetes, runs on Kubernetes. I think this is where Cobalt becomes particularly attractive. If you run this as just another application on the same infrastructure that you run um, the rest of your IT on, because then you can basically really manage everything in one way. Um, and if you think about uh, using that for edge scenarios or uh, across several data centers, it's very easy to replicate um, when the storage is just part of your Kubernetes cluster instead of something separate. Awesome. Uh, thank you, both of you, for taking the time and doing a great presentation. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who joined us today.